Good evening and welcome to Lord of Life. Welcome to our Good Friday Tenebrae service. Uh, the word tenebrae uh, literally means shadows. Good Friday uh, has our focus completely on the cross and as we worship together this evening, uh, candles will be extinguished as we see the growing shadows and the growing power of, of death that takes over on Good Friday. We want to thank you for joining us. We want to thank all of our musicians who have been part of this service for their participation. If you're worshiping from home, we encourage you to light a candle. And as the service comes to an end, uh, to leave that candle lit for a few minutes to, as a reminder that Christ, this candle will not be extinguished as part of the service, for Christ is a light no darkness can overcome. To access our bulletin, you can follow a link on our homepage or on our Facebook page. We begin with the call to worship. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and we loved darkness rather than light. God is light in whom there is no darkness at all. For God sent the sun into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, but all who do what is true come to the light. Come, let us worship in spirit and in truth.
Also with you. Let us pray. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, you carried, carried our sins in your own body on the, on the tree, tree so that, that we might have, have life. May we and all who remember this day find new life, life in, in you now and in the world to come, where you live and reign with the Father and the, and the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit now and forever. And forever. Amen. Amen. Forgive, a reading from Luke. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Forgive them? Is Jesus really praying forgiveness for his executioners? The sham trial, unjust conviction and execution of an innocent man is not the first mistake Roman justice has made. Other innocents had been crucified as well, but they protested, proclaiming their innocence through lips swollen in agony. But this is something new on a Roman cross, not a cry of protest or pain, not a proclamation of innocence, but a, but a prayer. A prayer that God would forgive the ones responsible for the nails holding him to the cross in his hands and feet. What is he saying? When men crucify their God, he is saying they can expect to hear something different. Thus begins Jesus' prayer. Forgive. Forgive them. His words make their way to heaven, burdened as no other prayer in history burdened with the sin of the loneliness and hate and terror of centuries before and eons since. A person's sin is, after all, limited by the time and space allotted to him or her. But on the cross, all of the sin of all of humanity of all time is swept up and embodied by the one who was crucified on a hill just outside Jerusalem. Here all sin and all forgiveness, total and complete forgiveness, come together. The sin of humanity is overcome by the greater gift of God's forgiveness. Let us pray. Forgive us, Lord God. Amen.
The second word is paradise, a reading from Luke. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly. For we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. We do not know the full story of the thief who repents. Like all of us, something has sent him down the wrong path. But unlike most of us, he's been caught and he hangs on a cross. And as he does, he reviews his life. He sees it as it is. And at the last, what might have been comes to terms with what he has become. As he hangs dying on the cross, God enters his life. The importance of making God his first priority never occurred to him until this moment, until his cry, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And quickly, there are words of reassurance from Jesus. You will be with me, I assure you, today in paradise. Words with serene clarity and certainty. You can argue about eternity and speculate about the hereafter, but here it is. The assurance of what is to be. Before twilight, Jesus and this wayward fellow on his right will be friends, inseparable forever in paradise, God and a thief, a thief and God. And so it is to be for you and for me. God knows who we are. God knows our deepest secrets. And one day, God will offer the same words of reassurance. Today, before sunset, you will be with me. Let us pray. Lord God, when you come into your kingdom, remember all your children. Amen.
The third word, behold. A reading from John. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple, the one whom he loved, standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. He said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. At this point, it is just an hour until Jesus will breathe his last. But for his mother and his buddy John, there are years yet to come. Standing here, where shadows meet shadows, he turns for a moment to call to the two as they watch and wait. Life somehow continues even beyond the crosses and the Calvaries. Jesus knew the loneliness of the crowds, the dark and quiet hours in the garden and on the hill. As he goes to be with the Father, it will be reassuring to know that his mother will not be alone on earth. As they look up and see his head crowned with thorns, Jesus looks down on the crowd. They hear his word, behold, behold. With that word, he creates a family, a fellowship so close that any one of us can have the same with any word if we just ask. A legend suggests that in the years after Calvary, Mary would often kneel alone at the summit of the hill in which there were still three holes and the earth was still separated from the earthquake and below which stood an empty grave and an open door a door to the future. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for the gift of the human family. We pray that we would see in all brothers and sisters, parents and children, we would see those things that draw us together rather than those things which separate us. Amen.
Fourth word, forsaken, a reading from Matthew. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if God wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At about three o'clock, Jesus called with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We've heard it said again and again how history repeats itself. There are a few events in history which are truly unique. But here on the cross is a moment in history which is truly unique. A man forsaken by God, torn off, cut off, from heaven and earth, the living and the dead, utterly and ultimately alone. The cry of forsakenness, emptiness in his shadowed eyes, the sudden flood of every sin of every soul in the history of the world from the Garden of Eden at the dawn of time to Cleveland in 2021 and beyond, raging in a broken heart. In that, in this moment, much more than when he breathed his last, Jesus truly died. You see, this is sin. It is not a matter of murder and adultery and gossip, something to do or not to do. Sin is always and ultimately loneliness, cutting yourself off from God, deliberately turning away from the truth, from goodness, from heaven, this is sin. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All the sin of the world he took into himself alone. He became sin for us and took our punishment for disobedience. It's a mystery, but only part of the great mystery which began in a stable and ends on a cross. Eloi, Eloi, Above the sound of his cry was the sound of tearing veils, of falling walls, of those left behind who would wander, groping, slumbering, falling in, in all the ways in which people walk when they turn from God. But there is now a way back, a way beyond Jerusalem, a way of hope to the place where the open arms of the cross have become the gate to eternity. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for carrying all the mistakes of all of humanity for all of eternity to the cross on our behalf. Amen. Suffering and shame 
And I love that old cross where the dearest stand best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay. Fifth word, thirst. A reading from John. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. 
and a jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of it on a branch of hyssop and held it to Jesus' mouth. I wonder what Jesus was thinking as he cried out in thirst. Perhaps he thought for a moment of the time long ago when he said the same woman, same words to a woman in Samaria at a well one day. I thirst. And then he told her about the living waters that he offers that never fail. And now he offers those waters to all the world. We're saddened by what happens next. Someone took a sponge wet with vinegar and held it to his lips. Perhaps it was better than nothing, the world's last offering to its king. Humanity carelessly offering the creator of heaven and earth a sponge filled with vinegar. If you've ever asked for a glass of water, if you've ever been thirsty on a scorching day, you know the cry of the Savior. If you've ever longed for a cool drink, in his cry from the cross, we see Jesus in his most completely human moment. He is the Lord of all things, large and small. The broken pencil of the child, the broken home, the broken life, the broken world, the broken promises. Nothing is too small or unimportant to he who is saying, who is saving the world as he cries from the cross, I thirst. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, help us to hear your call. Help us to hear it from all who thirst. Help us to respond, not with vinegar, but with life-giving water. Amen. The sixth word, finished. A reading from John. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
It is finished. One of those moments in history when time feels more like eternity, when you are between life and death, death and life. There's always something about the moment of death, no matter how expected or unexpected. There's something so final. But the death of the Son of God in a world where nothing is ever finished, there was more than a touch of eternity. His cry came from Calvary, but it echoed in the heart of God. The door has closed. The children are gone. The years of separation have begun. And he takes his step on the world's altar, and eternity lies before him. He has accomplished what he came to do. In the midst of the sorrow, this is the triumphant end of the plan. It has come to the planned conclusion. At the end of the third hour, the author and composer of our faith breaks the silence with the news that his quest has ended and the yearning of his heart is accomplished. Nothing, nothing remains to be done, not for him, nor for us, only to believe and to trust. Every hour now in the passing of time, at the deathbed, in the cathedral, in the chapel or the church, in the city and the village, in the wilderness and the highway, the end of time comes to the voice which cried through 2,000 years, it is finished. There is nothing yet for us, dear brothers and sisters, but to trust. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for what you have accomplished on the cross. Give us the faith of a child, the faith to trust you in all things. Amen. Maker 
bows his head, curtain torn in two, dead or raised to life, finish the final word and trust or commit a reading from Luke it was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon while the Sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two and Jesus crying with a loud voice said father into your hands I commend my spirit having said this he breathed his last and when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. Where eternity begins, the cross becomes the crown, the throne. The circumstances of living repeat themselves. One failure or success may teach us how to better meet the next, but for the supreme event, of death, life gives no rehearsals. We learn to face it from the one who went through the gates of death in our place. Shakespeare has Macbeth look at death and say, out, out, brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player, a tale told by an idiot signifying nothing. Goethe saw death and cried, light, more light. Anatole France looked at it. Draw the curtain. The farce has now played out. But Jesus, the Savior of the world, saw death as it was and as it is. A gate, a door, a beginning, not an end. A comma, a semicolon at most, but definitely not a period. We pray together as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord. Ooh, 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 ooh. So 
sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb. Oh, oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there?